This is BNH, and in this video, we'll take a look at the new 2020 iMac and 2020 iPad Pro and demonstrate how to use them for tethered shooting and retouching. The 2020 iMac is a fresh upgrade to the iMac line, adding the new nano texture glass to the screen. This matte display was brought over to the 2020 iMac from Apple's 32-inch 6K Pro Display XDR. The nano texture glass is perfect for working in areas with bright sunlight, which would give a glare on the traditional glossy display. I really enjoyed working with the matte screen. My older iMac has the glossy screen, and I found this to be so much better, but it still retained a crisp and color accurate image. The Retina 5K display on the 27-inch model provides plenty of real estate on the screen for multitasking. This also features the True Tone technology for better color rendition in different lighting conditions. True Tone is great for everyday use, but it's best to leave it off if you'll be doing any color correction on photos or color grading in video. The 2020 iMac has a refresh on all the internal components, with CPUs ranging from the 3.1GHz Intel i5 6-core all the way up to the 3.6GHz i9 10-core. Solid-state drives are now standard on all iMac models, providing fast load times and better performance in apps like Photoshop and DaVinci Resolve. When working with photo, video, or audio media, a solid-state drive makes a huge leap in performance and responsiveness. Previous models did have Fusion drives, utilizing a smaller flash drive for the operating system and applications, with a traditional larger drive for storage. Base models have SSD storage starting at 256GB, but if you're doing a lot of photo or video work, you definitely want to opt for a larger 1TB option. There's a variety of RAM options available at 266MHz DDR4, ranging from 8GB to 128GB. The 2020 iMac also has a big upgrade in video cards compared to the previous models. With video memory from 4GB on the Radeon Pro 5300 up to 16GB on the Radeon Pro 5700 XT, this range of video cards can provide the necessary graphic processing power for video editing and 3D work. This also has a 3.5mm headphone and microphone jack, a UHS-2 SDXC card slot, four USB 3.0 Type-A ports, two Thunderbolt 3 ports, and a gigabit Ethernet jack. There's also a new 1080p FaceTime HD camera, paired with the new built-in mic. This allows for improved video and audio quality which is crucial if you do any work from home or if you do any Zoom type meetings. Okay, so this is the 1080p camera built into the 27 inch iMac and I gotta say the quality on this looks really, really good. This is a crystal clear image. Uh, the exposure is pretty good too actually because I got this silk here uh, with a pretty harsh backlight but it's actually able to keep my face exposed. You can see some of the background there that's pretty dark. Uh, and this is a pretty good looking image. It's very clear. It's got the new microphone as well. The microphone and the speakers on this are really good. I think it picks up the bass in my voice pretty well, almost as well as my USB microphone does, uh, which is really nice for just a built-in microphone. The microphone on my laptop doesn't sound as good as this one does. This sounds very, very clear. Even when I play it back on the speakers on this iMac, it actually sounds really, really good, very bass heavy, uh, but the quality, you know, the fidelity is there. And I like this camera. I would actually do more Zoom calls with this camera. <laughs> I'm not too big on the uh, Zoom calls or work for home stuff, but you know, once you fix your quarantine hair, uh, it actually looks very good. I like this a lot. Apple currently has a solid line of desktop products aimed at the professional creator, such as the iMac Pro and the new Mac Pro Towers. So where does that leave the 2020 iMac? While it may not have the same robust specs as the iMac Pro or Mac Pro, the 2020 iMac can still carry its weight in the photo world while also handling 4K video. The iMac is a standard in any creative department due to its versatility for photo editing and graphic design work, working with apps like Photoshop and Illustrator, respectively. I set up a tethered shooting workspace with the 2020 iMac and tested it out with several different apps that I use in my own shooting and editing workflow. While the 27-inch iMac is on the larger side, at 19.7 pounds, it's easy to maneuver around the studio for tethered shooting or place it on a tether cart. For this setup, I'm using some of the lights that we have in our studio to shoot some costume jewelry to mimic an e-commerce shooting workflow. I keep a stack of costume jewelry that I use for shooting and editing practice, so we'll try shooting some rings. The rings will rest on an acrylic board below this large silk. 
I'm using the lights that we have in the studio pointed at the silk and using some cutouts of white paper as fill around the ring. I'm shooting with a 5D Mark III, which is tethered to the iMac through a USB cable, and I'll start off shooting with the EOS Utility software by Canon. Shooting tethered on a screen this size is ideal, allowing you to see any fine details that you may need to adjust with the image. There's plenty of screen real estate to show the live view feed as well as the previewed image and the camera controls. I'm shooting with a 100mm macro lens, which allows us to get the best detail of these rings, but the focal plane is very shallow. I'll use the focus controls to take a focus stack, which is a series of images taken at different focal distances which will be merged together to create an entirely in-focus image. The series of images are shot and then downloaded to the solid state drive on the iMac. After some preliminary raw edits, I'll import these into Photoshop to merge into a stack. Anyone who's used Photoshop for focus stacking knows that it's a bit on the slower side, depending on the amount of images in the stack and the complexity of the image. I have 10 images loaded into Photoshop, and they were stitched together in 1 minute and 20 seconds. While this may sound slow, this is actually on the faster side for Photoshop. I've done some focus stacks in Photoshop that have taken up to 5 to 6 minutes to process, so this is a breeze in comparison. Now we have a composite image entirely in focus and ready for retouching. While Photoshop is an industry standard with an array of features for photo editing or even 3D work, it can sometimes be bloated even on the best hardware. I'll shoot another ring and do a focus stack with 14 images, this time compositing the images together using Helicon Focus. If you haven't used Helicon, I highly recommend it. It's a leaner program specifically designed for focus stacking and produces great results. I'll drag the 14 images into Helicon and start the render process. It was able to process the composite in 9 seconds, which is actually really fast. On my computer at home, I'm working on a standard hard drive, and Helicon usually clocks in between 30 to 40 seconds for me, so having a focus stack in 9 seconds on an SSD is amazing. Next up, I'll try out Capture One on the 2020 iMac, and I'll use it for tethered shooting. EOS Utility is functional if you shoot Canon, but Capture One is great for tethered shooting with any camera, and it has great editing abilities. The setup is mostly the same. I'm able to enlarge the live view window on the iMac screen, which makes it easy to see the framing as I stack these three rings together for a group shot. This time around, I'm taking a series of 11 images, but I'll save them as 16-bit TIFFs. This will increase the file size, but the larger color depth gives smoother gradients to prevent banding, and it's preferred for high-end retouching. Capture One is able to export the 11 16-bit images in 12 seconds. Processing these 16-bit images in Helicon is still a breeze. I'll drag and drop in Helicon to process, and it took 16 seconds to process them into a fully in-focus composite, which is very fast despite the added color space and complexity of the image due to the overlapping rings. In an e-commerce setting, speed is crucial. A typical e-commerce photographer has to shoot up to hundreds of images a day, many requiring processing and focus stacking. The 2020 iMac is a base model, with the base specs of 8GB of RAM, 4GB of video memory, and 256GB SSD, but it performs superbly. With this kind of setup, I'll be able to shoot and process continually with virtually no downtime, which allows for more time to retouch or meet deadlines. Moving on to retouching, I'll take these process composites and edit them in Photoshop. This stack of rings is going to need a lot of work. Since this is cheap costume jewelry that I bought for $10, the rings are extremely tarnished and the stones are not set correctly. This translates to hours and hours of retouching. With a 16-bit image, this can be performance intensive due to the file size and the amount of layers that are necessary for the edit. When retouching 16-bit PSD or PSB files with a lot of layers, there can be a noticeable lag in the responsiveness of the brushes or the rendering of the image as you pan and zoom around. Editing this image on the base model of the 2020 iMac, I had none of these issues as I edited the stack of rings. This image was composited from several images shot on the 5D Mark III, so the final image is a bit over 23 megapixels. This may be lower than some cameras, which can shoot in the 40 to 50 megapixel range, but the edits done in Photoshop can still add up in file size. I created several touch-up layers comprised of brush strokes, clone stamp and healing tools, as well as some layers with gradients to fix the inner shank of the ring. From there, I added a color layer to adjust the color of the gold metal, and adjustment layers to adjust the exposure of the rings and the stones separately. 
As you retouch an image like this, the layers start building up and it can affect performance. Editing this image, I really had no performance issues with handling or saving. With 16-bit PSD or PSB files, Photoshop has a notoriously long save time, regardless of a solid state disk or traditional hard drive. But I clocked in the save time on this file at around 27 seconds. I wouldn't call the final result my best work, but doing some basic cleanup, exposure, and color tweaks on the costume jewelry makes them look slightly better than before. Again, in an e-commerce workflow, speed is always essential, so having a machine that can perform and keep up is crucial. I moved on to DaVinci Resolve and dropped some 4K B-RAW footage into the timeline to play around with. On the 2020 iMac, it was responsive and speedy when color grading, which I was able to do on the B-RAW footage with no proxies. As a project grows and the timeline gets bigger with a lot of color grades, I'd still recommend using proxies on this model iMac, but overall I found DaVinci Resolve able to run flawlessly editing and exporting these short clips. Another fun feature with the 2020 iMac is the ability to sidecar with the iPad Pro. This allows you to use the iPad Pro as a secondary monitor to the iMac, or run the iMac display mirrored on the iPad Pro, which opens up touch functionality with the iMac. To use the sidecar feature, you'll need the latest model iPad Pro, and make sure you can log in with your Apple ID on both devices. Have both devices connected to the same Wi-Fi connection, and you can connect the iPad through the sidecar drop-down menu or settings menu. I always prefer working with two displays while I edit. If you're like me and you get a million emails a day, this is a great feature that allowed me to edit in Photoshop on the main display while having my email open on the iPad display. The latency and responsiveness on the iPad display will depend on your Wi-Fi connection, and there's a noticeable lag, but it's helpful for keeping browser windows, finder windows, or other needed information open on the side as you work. The feature I like the most is the ability to mirror the iMac display onto the iPad and use the touch functionality of the iPad on the iMac. You can mirror the retina display ratio onto the iPad, which will show up cropped on the iPad. Or you can mirror the iMac display to fit the iPad, which has more of a square ratio. Using the Apple Pencil and Magic Keyboard, I was able to completely control the iMac and utilize the iPad to edit in Photoshop, the same way that I would with my Wacom tablet. The ability to use the processing power of the iMac while editing with the Apple Pencil was great, and I actually really liked editing like this. You can pick up the iPad and carry the display around to continue editing or using other apps. If you're a Windows user, you can still use the iPad Pro as a secondary monitor with apps like Duet, which give the same display capabilities as Sidecar on OS X, as well as some touchscreen functionality on Windows. Now let's take a moment to talk about the iPad Pro. I'm using the early 2020 12.9 inch model iPad Pro with the Apple Pencil and Magic Keyboard. I've always strayed away from mobile options, preferring to edit on a desktop or laptop if necessary, but I was pleasantly surprised at the power and capability the iPad Pro had to offer. For fun, I tethered the iPad Pro to my camera using the Canon Camera Connect app. It functioned exactly the same as the desktop version, and I was able to have full control over my camera for tethered shooting. I did a simple setup, one ring on a piece of white acrylic with two softboxes and some white bounce cards for fill. With the iPad Pro connected to the camera, I was able to autofocus onto the ring and then use the iPad to make the shot. The mobile version of Photoshop is very impressive, and it's almost as powerful as the desktop version. I was able to make a selection on the ring and remove it from the white background. The mobile version has layers enabled, so I was able to make a new layer to use the brush and clone stamp tools to do some basic cleanup on the ring. I actually did a lot of this by hand, without the Apple Pencil, and I was able to clean this image by just using my finger. I was able to make a layer with a gold color and use that color blend mode to adjust the color of the ring. I added a curves layer with a layer mask to tweak the exposure on the ring, and a separate exposure layer with a layer mask to do the exposure on just the stones. All in all, this was a simple edit to test it out, but it holds up almost as well as the desktop version. I do look forward to seeing how the mobile Photoshop app develops in future updates. If I had to choose between the iMac and iPad Pro as my shooting and editing workstation, I'd have to go with the iMac. But I do feel the iPad Pro is closing the gap in performance and functionality between the OS X and iOS ecosystems. I really enjoyed the added functionality the iPad brought to the iMac, 
and the ability to use the iPad as a display with a touch tablet for retouching is pretty cool. Apple has always been a great option for content creators, and in 2020, they've given us plenty to work with. This is BNH, and if you found this video helpful, please like, comment, and subscribe.